anybody have anything they want to share before we go on? Oh. Yeah, I didn't see very much walking around. Hope you brought your Bibles with you or your iPhones or whatever it is that you seek, seek the kingdom with. We're going to be in John chapter 4 tonight. I'm going to go ahead and get ready for that. But uh, in the meantime, I have to tell you a story of uh, a lady that uh, got married four times. And um, the first... Uh, husband that she married was a banker. And uh, then he ended up dying. And so she got married again and she married a movie star. Well, the movie star didn't quite work out so they got divorced. So she met a preacher. Married the preacher. And uh, that didn't seem to work out either so she divorced him and she finally ended up with a mortician, married a mortician. And uh, she was at lunch with one of her friends one day and uh, said, why, why is it that you picked those particular men to marry? And uh, the lady just looked at her and he, she said, well, she's mar- she, she said, I married one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, four to go. So. I know, bad, bad joke. Bad joke. However, it goes right along with what we're talking about tonight. So, so we have to, uh, have to look at that. So. John chapter 4. We are, uh, over the next nine weeks, just kind of studying a little bit about the life of Jesus and some of the things that he uh, brought forth. And uh, I'm, I would love for, uh, for some of you to be able to share, too, of maybe... Uh, some things that the Lord has been pressing on you about the life of Jesus or maybe one of your favorite stories uh, from the Gospels within that. So we're looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John a little bit as we uh, kind of go. So I I call it nine nine weeks with Jesus, at least right now, uh, on that. So go ahead, go to uh, the first one here. Um, As we look at this, I want you to notice something. Now, we're going to be in John tonight, in John chapter 4, but I want you to notice something in Matthew 10. To the 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. He said, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter into any towns of the Samaritans. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind because that is going to be important in our story tonight. But go rather, he said, to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go... Proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Remember the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven coming to earth, come, kingdom of heaven coming in us. We are uh, functioning in the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, so freely give. We're going to see in the next few weeks that a big part of Jesus' ministry in the first century was healing. Just about everywhere he went, he healed somebody. They, there were throngs of crowds of people that came and brought people that needed healing, and he healed them. And so as he sends the disciples out and he says, I want you to function in the kingdom. I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, drive out the demons. Isn't that interesting? And he told them specifically, when you go, he said, I don't want you to go to the Gentiles and I don't want you to go to the Samaritans. Who later on went to the Gentiles? Paul. Yeah, because we we studied about the life of Paul for quite a few weeks, right? He was the apostle that was called to the Gentiles. But Jesus specifically told them in this case, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So as we talk about this in John 4, I want us to look at this as how it is that we minister to hurting people. We come in contact with hurting people all the time. You and, you and I do at work, we do, we do in the grocery store, we do maybe in our own family. We come in contact with hurting people constantly, all the time. Go ahead and go to the next. 
Okay, so John 4. Let's look at the setting the scene here. When Jesus realized that the Pharisees were aware that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples, he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. Now, as we're kind of setting this a little bit, it's also interesting to me that the word says that the Pharisees thought that he was baptizing more people than John the Baptist did. But if you look back in the history and if you read the scriptures, did Jesus baptize anybody? No, not at all. If you can think of it this way, remember Paul when he was talking um, in, was it Romans? Was it Acts or Romans? Um, that he said, uh, some of you say that you're of Apollos. Some of you say that you are of Paul. Some of you say that you are of Peter. And some of you say that you are a Jesus, right? And then he goes on and he says, um, he says, can, can Christ be divided? You know, can we war against each other like this? Can you imagine if Jesus actually baptized people? The superiority that people would walk around with? Well, Joel was baptized with John the Baptist, but I was baptized with Jesus, right? And that's probably the reason why Jesus didn't baptize anybody. His disciples did. But Jesus didn't. So this is kind of the setting here. And so it says that he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. Go ahead and go on the next. He says, now he had to pass through Samaria. And I want you to notice there, he had to pass through Samaria. This actually was unheard of for the most part. Because what the Jews would do is that if they would go north, they actually went around Samaria. They would completely go out of Israel into another country and come back in above Samaria. So they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even go into some, the Samaritan borders. And so uh, as we look at this, it says that he had to pass through Samaria. He didn't technically have to, but he was supposed to go. And so he was, uh, um, he was passing through this. Now, if we look at this just a moment, why was it that the Samaritans and the Jews had such a rivalry? Well, 700 years before this, there was that animosity between the Jews and Samaria. And in uh, 722 BC, the Assyrians took over the world. They swept down from the northeast and they took the Jewish people captive. Not only did they do that, but what they would do, uh, they would kind of leave the farmers and the poor people alone. <clears throat> but they would make themselves intermarry with the people that they conquered. So that they basically would destroy the bloodline of whoever it was that they conquered. And so the Assyrians came in and, and they did that. As they did that, what they did was they came down, and, and we talked about this a little bit in the life of David. Remember how the kingdom of Israel was divided? And we had the ten tribes in the north, we had the two tribes in the, in the south. So the Assyrians came down, they took captive the ten tribes in the north, and Jeroboam at that point was the king, and he erected golden calves and idols and, and various things in, in uh, Dan and also Bethel. And so uh, he had all of this going on when the, uh, when the Assyrians came down. And of course, this angered God because they had gone back to idolatry and they were, they were doing this. So they took the, uh, the Assyrians took the homeland and they mixed their own people with it. And uh, there was that meshing together in that. Then in 586 BC, the Babylonians came down and took captive Israel. Okay, so the Assyrians did first. Then later on, several hundred years later, the Babylonians did. Right? This is right around the time in, uh, in the Bible with Ezra and with Nehemiah. And remember that they were basically, they were 70 years in Babylonian captivity. And then Nehemiah petitioned the king in order to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. Some of you remember that in the Old Testament. Okay? He goes back and he starts to rebuild Jerusalem. And a couple of guys by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah come down and they want to help him. However, San, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah had already mingled with the Assyrians, with their bloodline, 
or their, their ancestors had. And, um, and as they did that, they came down to try to help. This was basically where the Samaritans had come from. When they came down to help, Nehemiah said, no, we don't want your help. You're not pure bloodline. You've come from idolatry. You've come uh, you know, from ungodly roots and ungodly means. We don't want your help. And so they cast them away, basically. It's believed that Sanballat's son-in-law went, and as they uh, decided to go a different place and separate from the Jews, they went to um, Mount uh, Gerizim, and that's where they established the capital of Samaria. They built a temple exactly like the temple that was being built on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, exactly like uh, the one that Nehemiah and, his, and the Jews were building. And God had, of course, told the Jews, you are to sacrifice on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Okay? So, so this started uh, within that. And so uh, Sanballat's son-in-law went and, and began to do that. And so he, he produced a rival temple, basically. And the Samaritans, uh, they had their own priesthood. Uh, they only observed the first five books of the Old Testament. So they only observed the law of Moses. Anything that came after that, any of the prophets, David, the Psalms, Proverbs, any of that, they discounted. They didn't think that it was God's word. And so they just threw it completely out. So they were completely going by only the first, uh, first books of Moses. <clears throat> Today, there are only, it's thought to be there's only about 500 Samaritans left in the world the, of the pure bloodline of the Samaritans at that point. Okay? So they were rivals with the Jews because of this. That's the setting and that's the background of where we come to the story now that Jesus had to go to Samaria. And the reason that he had to go to Samaria was that his father was sending him on a mission. Okay? So he goes down to the town, the village of Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, since Jacob's well was there. And Jesus was weary from his journey, and he sat down at the well, and it was about the sixth hour, so it was about noon. Okay? He sits down. He's led by the Spirit. He's led by God. And he comes to go to the right place at the right time. Okay? What's the point? Ministering to hurting people, we have to be led by the Spirit. And God is going to strategically place you different places at certain times for reasons. And I'm sure that probably if we opened it up, you, you could testify of different ways that the Lord led you to a particular place so that you could encounter a particular person so that a certain thing could be done. And that's exactly what we're kind of looking with here with Jesus. He had to go through Samaria because God was leading him through that and the Spirit of God was leading him. And he goes to a well, Jacob's well, and he sits down and he waits. And it's about noon. Okay? Go ahead and go on to the next. So he's in the right place at the right time. As he does this, he's going to minister to somebody, but in order to minister to somebody, he has to have relationship to him. There is a certain amount of preaching that will bring people to the gospel if it's in a stadium. There's a certain amount of preaching that would bring people to the gospel if it was on a street corner. But for the most part, with you and me, we are able to minister to people and bring them to the Lord if we have relationship with them. See, if I just go up to some stranger on the street and start talking to them and I'm not led by the Holy Spirit, chances are I'm probably not going to get anywhere because I don't have a relationship with them. But if I have befriended somebody, let's say at work, or uh, you know, at the grocery store, or you know, some, some place that I go, and I have some type of a relationship with them, and I understand them and they understand me, then when I minister to them, they are able to, to glean something from that. And that's the way that Jesus starts out. He starts out with a relationship, and he says to the Samaritan woman who came to draw water, 
He said, give me a drink, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. This doesn't seem like a big deal to us. But in the first century, a Jewish man did not talk to a Samaritan woman. First of all, a Jewish man didn't really talk to a woman unless her husband was present. Remember, we studied about that. But in this particular case, here was Jesus, a Jew, sitting next to Jacob's well, and he was talking to a Samaritan woman, and he asked her, you know, can you give me a drink? Okay, go on to the next. Immediately he gets resistance. And she says to him, you're a Jew. How can you ask me for a drink, me being a Samaritan woman? For the Jews don't associate with the Samaritans. Now, what does this, um, what does this show? It shows, first of all, that she knew the law. She knew the history. She says, you Jews don't, don't interact with us Samaritans. And it was almost in one sense, if it was kind of put modern, it could be that she was saying, you know, how, how dare you talk to me? You know? We've been, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the Hatfields and the McCoys. We've been feuding for 700 years at this point. And you despise us and we despise you. How is it that you even talk to me? Right? There's a lot of churches tomorrow that are going to have Jersey Day because it's um, Super Bowl, right? And some people are going to have Philadelphia Eagles jerseys on. Some of them are going to have Kansas City Chiefs uh, jerseys on. We didn't proclaim that tonight. Um, Brian has Colorado, what is it? Is it Mammoth? Yeah. Which is, is that the lacrosse team? Yeah, okay. Okay, so he's, he's got his jersey on uh, with that, right? But if we all came in here and we had the, the Chiefs against the, the Eagles, you know, there might be a little bit of rivalry going on here, right? Okay, so that's kind of the way that it was here, of course. But she says to Jesus, how is it that you're even talking to me? Because we have been rivals. We have been feuding for hundreds of years. What it goes back to is that when we minister to people, hurting people hurt people. It's, it's difficult sometimes to understand why people react the way that they do toward you. That's not necessarily to let people off the hook if they're just being jerks, right? But if we can kind of understand where people have come from, it's easier to minister to them because hurting people hurt people. We're going to see why this woman was hurting and why she kind of had their reaction in just a moment. Go ahead and go on to the next. So he gets resistance here as he's trying to minister to her. So then she, they start having a conversation and there's some remarks that are going back and forth. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus said, you know what? You haven't got a clue who I am. And if you would have, you would have asked me for living water. Now this term, living water, in the first century, it, it meant non-stagnant water. It basically was water that was coming through a stream. And so it was not still, it was not stagnant, it didn't come out of a tepid pool, but it was actually flowing water is what he is saying. And he says, if you have any idea who I am, you would have asked me for living water. So he starts with these remarks. Go ahead and go on the next. Sir, the one replied, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? What's she, you know, what's she talking about? Again, she knows the law. She knows where the Samaritans have come from. She knows the history. She knows why it is that the Samaritans are at war with the Jews. She knows all of those things. What was a uh, misconception by the Samaritans is that they claimed 
that in their, their city, that that really was where Jacob uh, came and, and was sacrificed and, and uh, you know, dug the well and, and all of that, when really it wasn't. And so she's trying to, uh, to kind of come in here and, and have this repartee, this conversation that's going on, and basically say, again, you know, who do you think you are? Do you think you're greater than Jacob? Greater than our forefathers? You know, do, you more, do you know more than George Washington? Do you know more than Abraham Lincoln? You know, who do you think you are? And so she, uh, um, she starts to kind of come back on that. Go ahead and go to the next. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fountain of waters, springing up to eternal life. Jesus immediately starts to, uh, to be relatable to what she is looking at at this point. Okay? She comes down to the well to draw water, and Jesus is saying, I've got water that you don't know about. I've got living water. I've got refreshing water. And what was, what was Jesus doing? He was making her thirsty for what he had. Okay? Go ahead and go to the next. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. Now she immediately starts putting it into the natural. Right? She immediately starts to, uh, you know, to look at, at, at these things. And so she says, okay, well, if you've got living water, give it to me so that I don't have to come down here in this well anymore. She's looking at it in the natural. Jesus, of course, we know, is looking at it in the spiritual. Go ahead and go on the next. So Jesus told her, go and call your husband and come back. So it's almost like Jesus was saying, you know, we can talk about this, but go and get your husband first and bring him back so that I can tell him about it too. And what does she say? She says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you are correct to say that you didn't have any husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. So you have spoken truthfully. So Jesus is starting to minister to this broken woman, minister to the hurting, and he keys in on her point of need. Notice that he doesn't condemn her for it. We don't know why it was that she had five husbands. Remember that when we we studied uh, weeks ago about some of the law that, uh, that when women, if their husband died, it was the husband's brother's right and obligation to take her as husband or as wife, right, and become her husband. So it could have been that. It could have been that, uh, that she was a widow and that she had been picked up by, by the brothers, you know, something like that, right? Um, it could have been that actually she was a concubine. And in that culture, that was perfectly legal. She didn't have all of the legal rights of a wife, but yet, you know, it was legal for them to, uh, to live together. Um, there are all kinds of different things that it could have been. It could have been that she was divorced five times. Right? It could have been that after all of this, and maybe she was abused, we've, we've studied about that, about the letter of divorcement and the law, and what the Pharisees said, and maybe after all of that, that she just kind of gave up on marriage. And she said, okay, well, I'm just going to live with this guy. You know, whatever, because he's you know, he's going to take care of me, right? We don't know exactly what it was. But Jesus didn't condemn her for it, whatever it was. He simply said, you are correct. You have had five husbands, and the person you're living with now isn't your husband. And notice what she says. Go to the next one. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> right? And so, all of a sudden, there's recognition that comes. 
And maybe it was that Jesus named her husbands, you know, and said, yeah, your first husband's name was such and such, and your second husband was so and so. And, and uh, you know, we don't know. The narrative doesn't tell us. But as he's ministering to this hurting woman, all of a sudden recognition starts to come, and she says, wait a minute, I'm, nobody told you this. I perceive that you're a prophet. I perceive that you know something that you're not letting on. And what does she do when that happens? It's like all of a sudden she starts backpedaling. And she might have been afraid. She might have thought, you know, what, what is this magic trick that he's pulling? You know, who was it that he was talking to? How does he know? How does he know me? And so she starts back talking and immediately she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. This totally doesn't have anything to do with what Jesus was just talking about. But she starts to put up an argument, just like people that we talk to do. You know, well, why does a good God let bad things happen to good people? You know, tell me that. Right? Why is it that we can't just all coexist and get along in our world? You know, why does God let people starve in other nations. And so what happens is that as we begin to minister to hurting people, they're going to have rejection. They're going to have projections. They're going to have things that they say that are going to be a kickback. They're going to be a pushback on those things. And so she tries to get him off track. Well, you know, what about theology here? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but the Jews... They say that we're supposed to uh, worship in Jerusalem, right? So Jesus goes on, and he says, go ahead and go to the next one. Believe me, woman. Now, he wasn't, um, he wasn't using the woman term derogatorily. Look, woman, you know, <laughs> wasn't keeping her down like that. But he was just recognizing her. He says, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. He's not going to debate theology with her because he already knows. He already knows what the completeness is and what's going on. Okay? Go ahead and go to the next. He says, but a time is coming and now has come When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. For God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what he says to the Samaritan woman is he's saying, you know, we can debate all of this, but there's coming a time that all of this is not going to matter, whether we worship in Samaria or whether we worship in Jerusalem. Because those who worship God are going to worship in spirit and in truth. And that's the way that it is when we are ministering to hurting people. It's like we've got to kind of cut through all of the theological differences and all of the argument. And we've got to come down to experience. And we've got to come down to our worship of the Lord, our worship of God. And so Jesus says, God is spirit. Those who worship him are going to worship him in spirit and in truth. Go ahead and go to the next. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. See, the thing was is that we look at this story with the woman at the well and we, we kind of put her in a little box that she you know, has had five husbands. We don't know why. Uh, We know that she comes to this well in the middle of the day when nobody else comes because usually it was in the morning or or in the evening that people would come and draw water that the other women would. And so she comes in the middle of the day when nobody else is around and it could be because of her shame. It could be because she doesn't want to be around anybody else. And when we minister to hurting people, we have to understand where they're coming from and we have to understand that in our world that there are a lot of people that we minister to that that walk in shame constantly and you and I have experienced that 
And shame is from Satan. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world in the first part of John chapter 1, but I came so that the world would be saved through me. We don't need to walk in shame. We don't need to walk in condemnation because God's not putting that on us. And as we minister to hurting people, we can let them know that they don't have to walk in shame and condemnation either because Jesus came to set them free. So throw out all of the rest of that. That's what Jesus was trying to get across to this woman who came in the middle of the day because she was embarrassed or she was shamed or she was hated or she was talked about or she was gossiped about. And she was an embittered woman. She was a person that was caustic and lashing out. And everything that Jesus said, she wanted to push back. She wanted to argue theology. She wanted to say, why is it that you're even talking to me because you hate me? This is the mindset that she had. And this is the mindset of people that we minister to. The hurting people. That's their mindset. And Jesus gets under that. He disarms her with the conversation. He gets under her radar and says, all of these other things don't matter. And she says, because of her theological views, she says, I know one day Messiah is going to come. And he's going to take care of all this. And what does Jesus say? He says, you're talking to him. Now, that, that had to blow her mind. In the same way that when we have believed something all of our lives, just like they did, and all of a sudden that comes to fruition, or it comes to pass, we're amazed. And that's, that's what she is looking at here. Messiah, right? He says, I who speak to you am he. I'm the Messiah. Okay, go on to the next. And all of a sudden, revelation dawns. Right at that point, the disciples come back. And they're surprised that he's speaking to a woman. They're probably more surprised that he's speaking to a Samaritan woman. But notice that no one asks him, what do you want from her or why are you talking to her? You know, by this time, they pretty much know that Jesus is functioning outside the box constantly. Right? Um, later on, they ask him, you know, are, are you hungry? And he says to them, my food, my meat... My bread is to do the will of the Father. Now, now, if you think of that with you and me, and we're the disciples of Jesus, and it's like, you know, Peter, let's say, asks him a simple question. Lord, are you hungry? Well, my will, you know, my meat is to do the will of the Father. And, and I'm sure that sometimes Peter, you know, and all of them, they go, why can't you just give us a straight answer? Why can't you just tell us if you want some pizza or not? Right? Um, but what happens here, they, they came up, they see him talking to this woman, and they're like, shh, nobody even asked him what's going on, right? Then the woman left her water jar, and she went back into the town. She left what it was that she actually came there for, and she ran back into the town, and she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? And so they left the town and they made their way toward Jesus. Why? Because Jesus had to go to Samaria. He had to go where God sent him, where the Father sent him. He went into a place that they weren't supposed to go into. He went to a place that no Jewish rabbi would step over the border. He went to an area to minister to somebody that was out of the norm, and it was out of the, the, uh, the wheel well. It was out of the norm and out of the natural because the Spirit of God had sent him there. And he didn't go into the town to preach to everybody. 
He could get a crowd anytime he wanted to. All he had to do was to walk in to the town and start healing people. All he had to do was to walk into the town and start raising the dead. All he had to do was to walk up on the mountainside and start, start multiplying the loaves and the fishes. He could get a crowd anytime he wanted to. But he didn't go into the city and start getting a crowd and preaching to them. The Spirit of the Lord sent him to one woman. One outcast woman. One woman that nobody else cared about, that everybody gossiped about, that everybody shunned. And that was why she had to come to the well in the middle of the day. Because nobody liked her. And the Spirit of God sent him to one woman. And what did that one woman do? She turned around and she won the entire town to him. When we are ministering to hurting people, we have to listen to the Spirit of God. And we may go and talk to somebody that might be out of the norm. And it may not necessarily be somebody who is an outcast of society, but it could be um, somebody that puts on a facade and puts on a happy face and it looks like everything's going good and they're, you know, posting on Facebook and Instagram and everything's going cool. But really inside, they're shamed and they're guilt-ridden. And if you and I take the time to get to know them and to develop a relationship with them, we can minister to them if we will listen to God, if we'll be in the right place at the right time, and if we will listen to the Spirit of the Lord. Somebody had to witness to Billy Graham. And he turned around and brought countless thousands to Jesus. Right? Down through history, somebody had to witness to certain evangelists, to certain ministers, to certain celebrities, to certain people that brought multitudes to Christ. Your job may not be to stand up in a stadium and proclaim the gospel to 10,000 people. But your job might be to witness to somebody and bring them to Christ who will turn around and stand up in the stadium and proclaim to 10,000 people. And that's what Jesus did. One city, one woman, one outcast woman. Jesus just goes up. He's in the right place at the right time. He sits down beside the well and he just waits for her to come. Isn't that cool? If we can just be led by the Spirit. People are going to think we're weird. They're going to think you're strange. They would think you're strange if you say, you know, the Lord told me to do this. Right? There are instances, and some of you have shared those instances, that you are walking down the grocery store aisle and you see somebody or whatever, and the Lord leads you to go and talk to them. You know, maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe you can tell that they're having a bad day. And you just go and you give them an encouraging word or bless them or um, you know, tell them how cute their kids are or you know, whatever. Uh, right? Because you're led by the Spirit of the Lord, just like Jesus was. And that's what it is. And that's what happened. And so they left the town and all of them made their way toward Jesus. Uh, Go ahead and go on to the next one. Yeah. So as we look at this, when we are ministering to the hurting, you can go ahead and stand. Make sure that you listen to the Lord. That's really what this is all about, is listening to the Spirit of God, being in the right place at the right time, and then establishing that relationship. And when you establish that relationship with the person, you're going to get resistance. You're going to get pushback. But as you establish that relationship and you start interacting and communicating and having remarks back and forth and having repartee and maybe rationalizing a little bit and becoming relatable to those people, as we begin to do that, we can minister to the hurting. And when we start to do that, there's going to be revelation, there's going to be recognition that comes to them. So, the whole thrust of this story tonight is to listen to the Lord and do what He tells you to do. Listen to the Spirit of God. Because there are hurting people everywhere. You and I know that. We meet them every day. 
You have them in your family. You have them in your next door neighbor. You see them at the grocery store. You have them at work. There are hurting people everywhere. And it's our job to minister to those hurting people. That's what God's called us to do. And he may send you out different weird areas to be able to do that. That's really what, it, what this story is all about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for your word. Thank you for the stories. Thank you for Jesus and his life. Thank you that he came to be an example to us and that he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And Father, I thank you that, uh, that as this story unfolded and as it progressed, that we can see the way that Jesus ministered to this woman. Father, let your Holy Spirit quicken us to minister to people and to minister to the hurting, to minister to the down and out, to the downcast, to the shamed. And Father, if there's anybody under the sound of my voice right now that has been trying to minister, but the devil has been con condemning them and shaming them, Father, we, we come against that in the name of Jesus. Drive that shame out. Drive that condemnation out. For we know that your son did not come into this world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Father, I thank you for that. Help us to know that we don't need to function in shame. We don't need to function in condemnation. That our past can be the past at last. That it can be under the blood. That it can be forgiven if we just ask you to forgive us through Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you for that. And Lord, let us minister to a hurting world, whoever that is, whether it's our relatives, our next door neighbor, the people we work with, whoever we come in contact with. Father, let us minister to the hurting. And let us understand um, people. Give us insight. Father, give us supernatural insight to be able to minister to people anywhere we go in whatever we do, and to proclaim the gospel and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and walk in the kingdom and be able to minister to hurting people. And Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to say goodbye to uh, everybody on the tape. And uh, I know it's not tape, but <laughs> I'm old school about that. Oh, you got a beta tape going there, a VHS tape? Uh, anyway, <laughs> goodbye to all of you, and I'll have Reese and uh, Eva come up. We'll bless the children and bless the kids that are going to be in this cafeteria too. F oh, Father, thank you for Eva and for Reese. And Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you bless them. Father, give them insight into your word and into Bible stories and into uh, veggie tales and all of the... Uh, the things that, uh, that they study about you. And Father, bless them and keep them safe, and I thank you for that. And Father, we bless the children that will also be in this cafeteria in this next week. And uh, Father, that you would minister to them, that you would minister to their hurting hearts. And Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Very good. We've got uh, Jeannie cooked, uh, what kind of soup? Sausage tortellini. Sausage and cheese tortellini. So she's, uh, she's got that. So, and some, and other people have brought a few things. So let's go over and do some fellowshipping and some eating. And don't forget next week, love feast. So bring all of your favorite dishes and we will eat together then too. So. Bless you.